Hey everybody, it's Mr. Carr. Today we're going to be talking about uh, functions, but we're in this whole unit we're going to be talking about functions from a calculus perspective. Okay, so for section one one, we're going to be looking at bit of a review and stuff you should have seen before. We want to make sure we clarify some of these uh, some of these vocab terms and ideas. So today we're going to be able to identify our functions and determine their domains, ranges, y-intercepts, and zeros. Okay, um, there's also going to be some evaluating functions as well. So before we get into that, let's do a quick cover of interval notation. So interval notation is able to show a range of values, okay, with brackets or parentheses, okay? So what we do with these is brackets means we are going to include certain values. Uh, parentheses means we are excluding the values. So what that means is this. If I look at my inequality, negative 2 is less than or equal to x, and x is less than or equal to 12. So we are including negative 2 and 12 as part of this interval, okay, or part of this range of values. And let me show you. Okay, so what that means is I'm actually going to be doing a bracket on negative 2, comma 12 with another bracket. Okay, we are including both of these numbers as well as everything in between the two numbers. That's what the two brackets mean. So brackets are going to go with these symbols, the less than or equal to's or greater than or equal to's. Okay, so just keep that in mind when we see some other ones. The next one is x is greater than negative 4. Okay, so the other thing to remember about with our interval notations is we always write them from lowest to the highest number. Okay. So the lowest number, if I say x is greater than negative 4, negative 4 is the lowest number it goes, and it goes up forever. So we show that with our infinity symbol. So negative 4 is not a part, or sorry, negative 4 is not included because it's a greater than negative 4. So that gets a parentheses, okay? Infinity is not actually a number, it's just a concept. So we can't actually close that off, so we're going to do that with a parentheses as well. Okay, so not only do we exclude numbers with parentheses, but we always do uh, parentheses around infinity symbols, either positive or negative. And then we got a uh, union here. X is less than three. Okay, so again, if I go lowest to highest, less than three, the lowest number is a negative infinity, and it goes up to a three. We include, or sorry, we do not include the negative infinity, and we do not include the three. I'm going to do this part first when we do x is greater than or equal to 54. So that means my lowest number is 54. The highest is a positive infinity. we we'll put a bracket on the 54 and parentheses on here because we're including the 54 here. Okay. So when we're looking for an or, this is going to be, uh, sorry, not a union. Uh, it's, yeah, sorry, it is a union. So it's the two of them together. So we're going to put a u here. Okay, so that means that we are going between, like, it's got to be one or the other one. So we're consider both intervals as part of this. Okay, so that's our interval notation for these, when we have two, two inequalities like this with an or statement. Okay, so a function. Remember that a function f is from set A to set B is a relation that assigns to each element x in set A exactly one element y in set B. Okay. So what this means is that every input value has exactly one output value, all right? So you look at this, even though, for example, here, both 2 and 3 are going to the same output value of 8, that's fine. When you look at each of these, it's only going 1, 1, 1, and 1. What would make it not a function is if we did something like this. If I had 1 going to both 6 and 7, now it's not a function. But the way it is right here... It is a function, okay? So again, we're looking for every input having exactly one output. Now we can also see that in a graph pretty easily. It has to pass what's called the vertical line test. Any time you have a vertical line, uh, you have you can only pass through one point at a time. So it helps sometimes to have, if you have like a straight edge, I'm gonna use that as my little digital one here. If I take this and I drag it across, you notice how I only ever hit one coordinate point at a time. Okay, if it ever hits more than one point, it's not a function. So this one passes the vertical line test. So let's practice a few of these. 
determine whether the table represents y as a function. So when I look at my inputs, I've got one and one are repeated inputs, and they're going to two different outputs, negative one and one. Okay, so what that means is this is not a function. Okay, I have two different outputs for the same input of one. Uh, same thing happens with the four here, going to negative two and two, same, same idea. So these are two different ways why it's not a function. Okay, determine whether the graph represents y as a function of x here. So again, because we have a graph, it might help if we do a vertical line test. So I take it and I just drag it across. Does it ever hit that curve more than once? No. Okay, so it passes the vertical line test. So yes, it's a function. Okay, determine whether x equals 3y squared represents y as a function of x. So the biggest thing here with y being a function of x is it helps to have a graph. So x equals 3y squared, that's actually going to be, you know, just a very rough sketch here. It's going to be a sideways parabola. Okay, so which of that means it's also going to fail the vertical line test. So it's not a function. Okay, it's helpful to go ahead and use your graphing calculator to try to graph this, although this one's a little bit difficult than a normal graphing calculator, but feel free to use Desmos. That's a great tool for something like this. Okay, uh, now we're going to evaluate some functions. So remember with our function notation, when I say f of x, x is the input, then f of x is the output. So this is the result from that. Okay, so in this case here, x is, a, is equal to 3. So when I want to find f of 3, we are going to plug in 3 for every single x value. How I kind of like to start this is I'm going to replace all of my x's here with parentheses. And now I'll go back and put the 3 in. Now, I feel like this helps, especially if you're doing the negative numbers. So now we just do our order of operations. We can do exponents. We get 3 squared is 9. Uh, 2 minus, <clears throat> excuse me, negative 2 times 3 is give me negative 6, then minus 8. And then f of 3 is going to be 9 minus 6 is negative 3, <clears throat> minus 8 is, a, or sorry, 9 minus 6 is 3, minus 8 is a negative 5. Okay. <clears throat> this also works if we are going to work with <clears throat> expressions. Here, my input is 2a minus 1. That's going to be replacing x in this case. So f of 2a minus 1 is going to be, again, I'll do parentheses squared, minus 2 times parentheses, minus 8. <clears throat> I put 2a minus 1 in, in both of those sets of parentheses. And now I just have to simplify this one. So I'm going to start with 2a minus 1 squared. Remember, this is actually going to be 2a minus 1 times 2a minus 1. So I'm going to distribute here. So I'm going to have 4a squared minus 2a minus 2a plus 1. So 4a squared minus 4a plus 1. So get a little start here. We get 4 a squared minus 4a plus 1. Here I'm going to distribute the negative 2. So that's going to become a negative 4a and a positive 2 and then minus 8. And now we're just going to combine our like terms. So f of 2a minus 1, 4a squared. We've got negative 4a, negative 4a is going to give me a negative 8a. And we got a positive 1, positive 2, and a negative 8. So it's going to be a negative 5. All right. Okay. Domain. As a reminder, domains are going to be the all the possible all the possible input values. So for the most part, it's going to be the x values. Now think about some restrictions that we're going to cover. Here's restriction number one. Since we're dealing with a square root, okay, restriction number one cannot square root a negative. Okay, so when we're trying to analyze what's my domain here, we need to consider that there are certain values that will make this a negative number inside the square root symbol. So that's why we can say this way, 4x minus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 0. This is what my domain will be in this case. Okay, so it's just a very quick inequality I'll uh, solve here. Oops, I want that. We're going to add one to both sides, so 4x is greater than or equal to 1. And then divide by 4, and I get x is greater than or equal to 1 fourth. Okay, so that is one way of describing our domain. 
x has, just has to be greater than or equal to 1 4th. With interval notation, don't forget, 1 4th is going to be the lowest number. Positive infinity is the highest. We'll put a bracket on 1 4th and a parenthesis on the infinity symbol. Okay, so that means anytime there's a number that is not greater than or equal to 1 4th. Okay, so for example, let's try 0. If I put a 0 in, that's 4 times 0 is 0. Minus 1 is a negative 1. Square root of that is a negative number. That's impossible. Okay, so that's just one example there with that. Whereas if I put in 1 fourth, 1 fourth times 4 is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. That I can square root. Okay, so another one we can consider, case number 2 for our domains. When I am dealing with rational functions like this, there is something that makes this impossible in, uh, in the denominator. Remember, we cannot divide by zero. So if that's the case, I need to consider this case, this possibility. T squared minus one cannot equal zero then. Okay, so that's what I'm going to consider here. I'm going to solve it this way. Now, this one's pretty easy for factoring. I'll do T minus one times T plus one equal to zero. T, T minus one equals zero. T plus one equals zero t equals 1 and t equals negative 1. So technically speaking, I should say this. These are all technically not equal there. So what we have here is two values that would make this a function impossible, and that's a positive 1 and a negative 1. With interval notation, if I want to say it's not a 1 or a negative 1, so that means it could be any negative number I want up to negative 1. It could be any number in between negative 1 and 1, and it could be any number greater than 1. And since there's three separate intervals, we're going to put those together with the union symbols. Okay, so that's my domain here. So it's every number that is not one or negative one. For my other example here, we can combine two ideas. Now, remember, the two rules we talked about is you can't square root a negative and you cannot divide by zero. So before, we were able to say that with a square root symbol, it has to be greater than or equal to four. In this case, no, it can't work. So in this case here, we have to say that 2x minus 3 has to be greater than 0. That's the only way for this function to work. Okay, Any other value, if it was equal to 0, means I'm dividing this function by 0. If it was less than 0, that means I have a negative inside the square root symbol. Okay, So we're going to go ahead and just take 2x. We'll add 3 over. So 2x is greater than 3. Divide by 2 so that x is greater than 2 thirds. And that's it. Those are the only values that will work here. So again, my lowest number is 2 thirds. My highest is infinity, parentheses on both of these because it's greater than now. All right, quick uh, real life example here. Uh, realtors in a metropolitan area study the average home price per square foot as a function of total square footage. Evaluation yielded a following piecewise defined function. Okay, it's very complicated, but here's the key here. These are telling us kind of certain values or intervals in which the domain exists. So with a piecewise function, it's actually multiple functions that make up one overall relation. So for example here, <clears throat> find the average price per square foot for 1,400 square feet. The key with this is we got to first find which interval does that show up into. You notice 1,400 is in between 1,000 and 2,600. Okay, It does not pass either of those. It does pass the first one. So the idea here is that I, all I have to do is take 1,400 and I plug it into that first function, okay? As a reminder, there were three different functions here. This one, uh, this one, and this one, okay? Three different functions depending on which, what's the uh, average price for per square foot. So we're going to put it into this first one here, okay? So that means that we can say P of 1,400, is equal to 1,400 minus 1,000, oops, over 40, and then add 75 afterwards. So now we're just going to go ahead and simplify this value. Okay, so we got 1,400 minus, a, minus 1,000 is going to be 400 over 40. So that divide that out, I get 10 plus 75. So my answer here is 85. Okay, and so what that represents is that's the average price per square foot. So it should be $85 per square foot. Okay, and that's it for our introduction of functions today. Um, I'll take care. See you in the next one.